Good evening, everybody. It's a beautiful evening here in uh, Southern California. My name's Nathan, and I'd like to talk to you tonight about freedom, and in particular, biblical freedom. Now, Winston Churchill said back in his day that all the greatest things in life, the most aspirational things, can be described in just a simple single word. Freedom, duty, honor, life, peace, love. These kinds of things are the aspirational things that we all seek after. And what I want to talk to you tonight for just a few brief minutes uh, is freedom and from a, the Bible's perspective. Do you know, we live in an age of unparalleled freedom. And just to begin, I'd like to take you through just a journey, if you like, of the last 250 years of time. Around 250 years ago was 17 1789 and the French Revolution. It was a tumultuous time when the French people overthrew the king and the church. They got rid of the regal system and the priesthood. And they thought that they would be free. That was the age of modern enlightenment, rationalism. And that freedom was going to spread across the world. In essence, they started to get rid of authority. Now, it was probably about 70 years later that Charles Darwin wrote his world famous book, Origin of the Species, where in that book, he starts to to doubt or to cause aspersions on creation. He says that we evolved from uh, some kind of slime in the past. He did away with God. He said, there's no need to feel responsible to a God who doesn't exist. And so Charles Darwin started a process of doing away with God. Well, a few years later, there were the German School of High Critics, led by Julius Wellhausen in the 1880s. They started casting aspersions on the validity and the authenticity, the accuracy of the scriptures. Oh, there's lots of mistakes. There's lots of contradictions, they said. The scriptures are not a reliable source as an authority for life. And so they cast out the Bible. After Julius Wellhausen, we have other philosophers who came along. Friedrich Nietzsche in the late 1880s, who extolled perspective rather than truth. He started to say moralism or our morals are relative. There's no such thing as absolute truth. One of the most famous things he said was, there are no facts, just interpretations. So see what the world's done in the last 100 years, 200 years or so. They've got rid of all kind of authority. They've got rid of the church. They've got rid of king, they've got rid of God, they've got rid of the scriptures. They have proclaimed themselves free. And in the 1960s, after two world wars and all sorts of depression, uh, the Great Depression, the world was ready in the 1960s for hippies and freedom. And this is the world that we have inherited. The world has never been more free, or so it would tell you. Because in actual fact, the world has never been more enslaved, never been more entangled, never been more held hostage, never been more addicted, never been less free than what we are now. Because you see, it turns out that when you get rid of all authority and God and the scriptures and any kind of absolute truth, it turns out that the only thing you can be enslaved to is yourself. And that's really a description of our world. We live in an age where man has enthroned himself or herself as the absolute arbiter of their own destiny, the center of the universe. And now we find, sadly, we wake up to a world where everyone is absolutely absorbed in themselves and nobody really is free. Addictions are on the increase, whether it's addictions to pornography, whether it's addictions to gambling, whether it's addictions to video games, base jumping, anything you can name, the world can give it to you in the name of freedom, but actually we've never been more enslaved. Entertainment, buying things, social media, what kind of identity we have online, we've never been more enslaved. Because 
it turns out that we never really were enslaved to the tyrants and the despots and the kings that we thought we were enslaved to. We actually always were enslaved to ourself and to sin. And so really, the world, society, has proclaimed themselves free, but in actual fact, the way they define freedom is freedom from authority in order to sin. But that's not how the Bible defines freedom. God's solution is actually the antithesis or opposite of that. God's idea of freedom is that we are free from sin in order to willingly submit to authority, to God, to Jesus Christ. Those two things are totally different. And what the world sees as freedom, freedom from authority in order to sin, is really actually license. That's never going to bring freedom. Doing anything and everything you want, whenever you want, selfishness, run rampant and riot, will only bring disappointment and despair. But God's freedom, the freedom that He offers us, is something far greater. It's freedom from sin in order to willingly submit to God. And in Him, we find true liberty. Now, how do you think we might be enslaved to sin? Well, I'm going to suggest to you today that actually there's just three ways. And they're all in Genesis chapter 3, because Genesis chapter 3 really is the foundation of the world. Anything that's important in life, an immutable principle for life, is going to be found in Genesis chapter 3. And what we find in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 10 is that actually when Adam and Eve sinned, they became enslaved to the three consequences of sin. And those three consequences were shame, concealment and fear because Genesis chapter 3 verse 10 Adam says that when he heard the voice of God he was ashamed because he was naked and he hid himself because he was afraid shame concealment and fear we experience these three things the hallmarks, if you like, of a bad conscience whenever we sin, and we've all experienced this thing. We feel ashamed, we want to cover our face, and we get afraid. And this is what Adam and Eve experienced. And I'm going to suggest to you that whatever the world offers us, they can never offer us freedom from the consequences of sin. But God and Jesus Christ can, and let me tell you how. The first problem of shame Adam and Eve tried to solve by themselves. It says previously in Genesis chapter 2 that they were naked and they were not ashamed. They stood before God and they didn't feel that embarrassment. But as soon as they had sinned, they felt that nakedness causing shame. They couldn't shake that feeling. And so they tried to sew fig leaves together to cover their shame and their guilt. But there's two reasons why Adam and Eve's solution would never work. Why society's solutions for these problems will never work. The first one is that it's provided by ourselves. Adam and Eve tried to do it for themselves. But let me tell you, you cannot be the problem and the solution. But that's what Adam and Eve tried to do. And secondly, we know that actually fig leaves might be able to cover nakedness, but they can never cleanse our conscience. They can never cleanse our mind from sin. So what Adam and Eve tried to do to get rid of their shame was never, ever going to work. But God had an answer. He had an answer. And in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21, he was going to provide that answer. Not just for Adam and Eve, but for all of us. A covering of skins of animals. It really prefigured the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Shedding of blood was necessary and we identify with that shedding of blood and when we do we receive proper forgiveness. So when you feel ashamed and you try to perhaps indulge in society's solution for shame which might be positive self-talk, 
uh, s talking ourselves up, building up our strengths, that's never going to work. The true solution for shame is accepting God's solution, which is forgiveness of sins in Christ. And when we do that, every time we do that, when we feel shame, we can feel freedom when we confess our sins, God is just and righteous to forgive them, as he says in 1st of John. So the first problem that we have enslaved to sin, shackled by sin, shame, it can only be solved by God. And he offers us true forgiveness that we might have freedom in our minds from the things, the shame and the guilt that we experience from things we've done in the past. Well, the second problem that Adam and Eve had was hiding, concealment, trying to hide who they really were. And we really have this problem right now in our lives. This is our everyday problem. We experience shame for the things we've done in the past, but our problem in the present is really that we hide ourselves. We hide from God, we hide from each other who we are, and we maybe even sadly sometimes hide from ourselves. But the principles of God, God's word tell us that we need to bring the dark and hidden secret things into the light. And when we do that, when we choose to shine light on the dark secret parts of our character and life, then we experience freedom because those things no longer shackle or enslave us. Because God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And he has promised us that if we bring our problems, our sins, our ills to him and we confess them, that he will be able to release us from those things. And in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 24, God was going to provide a solution for hiding to Adam and Eve so that they would no longer be tempted to conceal their sin or to indulge in dark secrets. He appointed a meeting place where Adam and Eve, maybe every day, maybe once a week, would come and meet with the angels at the entrance to the Garden of Eden. And there would be conversations, there would be fellowship, there would be maybe teaching, and they would they would confess their sins to God. You'll remember, perhaps from Genesis chapter 4, that Abel and Cain presented their offerings before God. And when Cain was rejected, he went out of the presence of God. He left the angels at the entrance to the garden. So, God has said to us, if you meet with believers and you fellowship with them on a regular basis, this is the way that we confess our sins to each other and we no longer hide. We bring ourselves into the open. And that's what we do. We come every Sunday and we remember our Lord Jesus Christ. And in the light of his example, our deepest, darkest secrets are brought out into the open and we can seek forgiveness of our sins. So that was the second problem that Adam and Eve had, concealment, and God provided the solution for that problem. Well, what about the last one? Shame for the things we've done in the past. Currently in the present we hide. What about fear? They were afraid. This is something that affects all of us. This is fear for the future. This is what Adam and Eve experienced in Genesis chapter 3. And sometimes fear can enthrall our lives as well. We worry about the things that are coming. We worry about the things on the horizon. The things that we can't see, the things that we can't control, the things that we can't predict. But do you know that God has a solution for fear as well? He says in Timothy, he's not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And do you know what God's offered to do for us? He's offered the most perfect solution because... The solution he provided in Genesis chapter 3 was the promise of a saviour. It's there in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. The seed of the woman would come. It would crush serpent thinking and it would bring freedom and life 
back to the world. That was God's first and foremost promise, a solution for fear, and we call that faith. We've got to have faith in what God has promised to do to free us from the effects of sin. Now, here's the most amazing thing, because fear can enthrall us, but fears are only imaginary things. They're things that we worry about and anticipate, but they're not really real because they haven't happened yet. They're future, and fears can only be conquered by another future force, and that future force is faith. Because if we fear the things we can't see, and the things we can't control, and the things we can't predict, do you know what faith is? Faith is, we have faith because we can't see things, we can't control them, and we can't predict them, and we believe God can. So fear and faith actually dwell in the, or live in the same place in our minds. They're mutually exclusive. They're like light and darkness. And when faith enters our minds, it will dispel fear, displace fear, because they're both about things we can't see, we can't control, and we can't predict. And God gave the gift of faith to Adam and Eve. He said, here is hope, hope of deliverance. Look forward into the future, because there's a man coming, the seed of the woman, who will crush serpent thinking and bring ultimate freedom. And so, God invites us to indulge the power of faith in our lives. Because when we do, it will push fear to the periphery. And the things that we worry about, our mortgages, our health, our families, all of those things will, will be on the periphery if faith is at the center. That's the promise of God, that he will take care of us. He'll look after us. He has a solution to these three great consequences of sin. We're free from shame if we accept God's forgiveness. We're free from concealment if we meet with fellow believers, confess our faults one to another, and bring our dark ways into the light before God. And we're free from fear because faith is able to displace fear as light displaces darkness. This is the hope of the Bible. This is in summary, if you like, freedom from sin. Because actually, the one thing we are enslaved to in this life is ourselves and sin. And if we can be free from those three things, then that is freedom indeed. And Jesus Christ said, the truth can make us free. These things are all freely available. We live in a world that's never been more enslaved, but the hope of the Bible is right here. It's tangible. We can live free and open lives if we're willing to take these principles on board. Now, you know, this seems like almost too good to be true. And the world, society in general, is not interested in God, not interested in anyone telling them what to do. Freedom for them lies in doing whatever they please. And guess what the result is? Well, they do things that they should be ashamed of, but they're not. They do things that they should conceal, but they don't. And they do things that should make them afraid, but they're not. And the Bible has something to say about that, because in Jeremiah chapter 6, it describes the nation of Israel, and God says, they should be ashamed, but they can't even blush. They're still enslaved to the consequences of sin. What about Isaiah chapter 3? It describes the nation of Israel and says, they, they practice their sin like the sin of Sodom, and they hide it not. They do things that they shouldn't do. They should actually hide but they're proud about them. They proclaim them. They call them pride days, pride months. This is the world actually still enslaved to sin. And Romans chapter 3 is going to say, of the people in the world who don't experience the freedom that's in Christ, there is no fear of God before their eyes. So those three things that we know can enslave our minds and our lives, shame, concealment, and fear 
are still running rampant in society. So my, my um, request f from you is to look into these things, to see what the Bible has to say, to see how perfectly God anticipated the problems and provided the answers all there in Genesis chapter 3 perfectly even really it was there before Adam and Eve had sinned this is the freedom of the Bible this is the freedom that God wants us to have freedom from sin that we might willingly submit to him because friends when we do that when we're willing to make ourselves free from sin then truly we are free indeed.